wonderful. It's lovely to be with you uh, all this morning again. Um, it's really nice to be able to just, in a, a meeting of this size with all you here, just to be able to, to minister to each other. I think it's nice, isn't it? You pass the microphone around. Um, we hear something that, uh, that everybody brings something different, don't they? Everybody contributes something. And it's very nice to, to feel uh, in such a, a body of Christ uh, where you can um, comfort, exhort, challenge, strengthen each other, share with each other. And I think that's really fantastic. Um, and what we're going to do this morning um, is we're going to be preaching actually not so much on a particular passage, um, but actually on a, on a topic this morning. Um, generally, I like to, to preach from a passage, but uh, I felt this was something that God was um, prompting me to, to talk about and something to look into more. Um, if we could bring up the, uh, the PowerPoint. We're going to be looking this morning at um, what does it mean to, to be Trinitarian? What does it mean to be a Trinitarian church? What does it mean to be a, a Trinitarian believer? What difference does the, the Trinity uh, make in, in your life? This might sound like it's about to be a very abstract talk, but actually it's not. Because uh, it's something that's absolutely vital uh, and is absolutely relevant uh, and crucial um, for every one of us. So uh, just before we um, get into a little uh, scripture reading, I'm just going to pray. Father, this is uh, such a huge topic as we approach this. This is something beyond uh, our understanding fully. So we know that we, we really need your help. Father, I just ask, Lord, that, that you might, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that you might help us to, to understand, to grasp, to enter into more and more of this, uh, that uh, you might open our hearts and our minds, Lord, that this would shape us, change us, mold us, transform us, Lord, that we might reflect uh, the image of uh, Jesus and the image of the Trinity that we've been brought up into. Amen. 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 I'm just going to begin with a few verses from Scripture to open this up for us, uh, up here on the uh, projector, from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. It says this, for through him, that's Jesus the Son, uh, we both have access to the Father, both as Jew and Gentiles, by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him too, you are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So this is what the Apostle Paul is saying about the church, and he's saying about this church. Uh, we are being built together to become a dwelling for God by his, his spirit. You see how Trinitarian this passage is, isn't it? We've got the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We are being to become a, a temple, a temple to the honor of God, of God the Father, a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. How does this happen? We have access uh, through the Spirit. It is Jesus Christ himself that is the whole, uh, sorry, the chief cornerstone. Everything is knitted together. Everything is, is neatly structured by and for the Trinity. So what do we mean by the Trinity? I think we have to just open this up just a little bit now. What is the Trinity? We believe in one God. This is our confession is that we believe in one God who is three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's putting it in a very simple way. Now, you've probably heard lots of different illustrations um, of the Trinity. All of these fall short, of course, in some way. Um, there was a, a, a theological lecturer, and uh, he used to begin, um, when they used to talk about um, God, uh, he used to always begin his lectures saying that what we're going to do, it's like we're going out to fish for a whale. The image is this, that you, you've got like a line and your fishing rod, and you're not fishing for a little fish, you're, you're fishing for a whale. It's a big task, because if you're trying to, to just grapple with and grasp who God is, and what is the Trinity, it's something that is actually beyond our understanding, that we can never fully comprehend it. What we want to do is just to begin to grasp just a, just a bit of it. So what we are doing this morning is we are, in a sense, going fishing for a whale. One of the images that you've probably heard before is that of the shamrock, you know, the, the three-leaf clover. 
the shamrock has three leaves. So you say, well, it's like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's joined together in one. But of course, even that is, again, a bit limited, isn't it? Because the shamrock is inanimate. It's not like the, the God is exactly uh, like that either. It doesn't say much about who the persons are. It's kind of interesting that perhaps for this reason, um, you don't actually see in, in Christian art, if you go into a, an old church, an old cathedral, particularly in, in the East, you might see some paintings. Actually, in Christian art, there are not many paintings of the Trinity. It wasn't something that really happened much, not until the sort of later medieval period. For that reason, that, well, how, how, how can you draw God, the Father? How can you draw the Father? How can you draw the Holy Spirit? Um, so sometimes what they did, this is one from um, Andre Rublev, the icon painter, uh, they sometimes painted them as three uh, angelic angels. The reason being from Abraham in Genesis, when he had the three visitors. So it was kind of symbolic, represented Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It, it's difficult to, to get your heads around. Uh, sometimes they use this image, which is perhaps actually in a way, maybe the closest image that we can uh, get to the Trinity of... Uh, a, a man with, with three heads, a figure with three heads. What they're kind of getting to here is the fact that, that each Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is, is a person, persona. The word actually originally has a sense of like, um, like, like a mask that someone wears, their, their appearance. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is like the communication of God of the Trinity to us. So there's something in that image, even though it looks a bit, a bit strange. Uh, underneath this is very old little diagram here that's in Latin, but let's translate that into English. Okay. So, what is the Trinity? It's really important for us to get our, our, our minds and, and our hearts around this. That Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is, is not the Son, is not the Holy Spirit. They are different persons in the Trinity. But Father is God, Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and together they are they are God. So it's easy to make those straightforward statements that we know that we're not, not getting, it, getting it wrong here. So question then, does the Trinity matter? Is this just going to be a really abstract talk, a theology lecture? Absolutely not. I'd say absolutely not. The Trinity really, really matters. Um, the theologian Karl Rahner uh, once suggested in the 20th century that if the doctrine of the Trinity disappeared overnight that most of the church wouldn't notice but I hope that's not true. Um, I'm sure it's not true of here at all. It absolutely matters because it says who God is. And it matters who God is, doesn't it? It matters who we worship. So we need to understand the Trinity. We need to enter into the life of the Trinity. The Trinity affects every aspect of the work of God and our life. There is nothing that God does that is not Trinitarian. In your life, in our church, in the world, everything he does is Trinitarian. Every way that we relate to him in our life, when we pray to God, when we read the Bible, when we meditate on him, when we worship him, all of these relate to God as Trinity. We're going to unpack a bit this morning about the, uh, what that means and the richness of it uh, and all the wonderful things that come from that. So God is one being eternally existing in, in three persons. There's usually um, one way or another we can go a bit wrong on that in our thinking. So on the one hand, if we split up the persons, we can lean towards thinking, feeling that there are kind of like three gods, you know? like three gods. There's a Father God, Son God, Holy Spirit God. But that isn't right, is it? That's not correct. There's, there's one God. The Bible makes that very clear. There is one God, not three gods. Neither are they three individuals. When I say individual, I mean someone who has like a separate will. The orthodox classic teaching is that God has one will. It's not like the Son wants to do one thing, the Father something different, the Spirit something different. They have, they have one will. That's called tritheism, if you split them up. Well, on the other hand, on the other way, there's something called, called modalism. It's not that there is one God who at different times just manifests, has a different mode, manifests himself. He is sometimes the Father, sometimes the Son. He is sometimes the Holy Spirit. That isn't right either. He is one God, eternally in three persons. Sometimes people think, oh, it's three persons that is one person. Not really, no, it's, it's three persons of 
in one being, one substance, that's the idea, that is God, that is eternally three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there's a lot of beautiful things that come from this. It's quite easy, though, to get into some misleading examples. Uh, Paul Fides is a theologian, a Baptist theologian, who gives some uh, examples of this. Uh, that, uh, you know, a pastor could say, well, you know, you have, how many names have you got? I have three names, Jonathan, Peter, and Marvin. And so you might say, well, it's like that for God. You know, his name is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yes, but again, that's probably not quite right. Again, that's a bit like modalism, isn't it, in a way? It's like different modes of being. I'm still one person, Jonathan, even though I have three names, so it's not quite right. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons. Or the other analogy is maybe like the football team. Where you've got the manager, a coach, a player. Yes, a bit, because Father, Son, Holy Spirit, maybe, um, we'll talk about this later, uh, have different roles to some extent, or appear to. But again, that's a bit like tritheism, because the manager is not the same, the manager is not joined to the player or the coach. They're not one being, are they? They're all separate people. So it's important that we kind of get our minds around this. It is beyond our complete understanding in this life, but don't give up because it doesn't mean that it's, it's irrelevant. So the Trinity expresses who God is to us, and I think this is very important to understand this. That actually, uh, even for the early church, they, they didn't invent the doctrine of the Trinity. Right? They didn't think, how can we come up with an obscure idea? Or um, uh, how, how can we just come up with this sort of modification of there being different gods and things. It was actually part of their experience. You know, it was unquestionably the early church's experience that God was Trinity. And that's probably your experience too, that, that God is Trinity. You relate to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we try and then think, okay, how can we write that down? How can we make sense of that? How can we talk about that in a way that we can then share and understand with other people and that's helpful to, to us and to everyone? One of the remarkable things about this is because God is not just a sort of, take Islam, right? It's based on what you might call radical monotheism. In Islam, there is one God who is one person. He's eternally been one God, one person. So in eternity, who did that one God love? Nobody, because there wasn't anybody. He was just alone forever in eternity. But that's not what we believe, is it? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were eternally expressing love towards one another. In fact, the classic idea is that the Father has eternally begotten the Son, and the Holy Spirit comes from the love between the Father and the Son. So God is eternally love. And we are brought into that eternal love. We are actually brought into the relationships of the Trinity. That's a deep and profound thing to say, isn't it? That you have been brought into, if you're in Christ, you've been brought into the life of God, into the Trinity so our lives then, and our churches, need to be expressly Trinitarian. We need to think very consciously. Are we being? Are we understanding? Are we speaking? Are we entering into the Trinity in the fullest possible way that we can? I think it's an interesting thing that I've kind of um, noticed anecdotally, that sometimes our type of church reflects the language that we use, and in particular, uh, who we talk about most in our services. So if we talk a lot about the Father, or the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it interestingly reflects often what kind, of, what kind of church we are. It doesn't always hold true, but I've noticed there is something in this. So in some churches, they will generally talk about God or the Father a lot. What's quite interesting is often those churches may focus on the majestic, the holiness, the awesomeness of God, the awesomeness of the Father. The fact that we, we, we can't see him, we can't conceive fully of him. But at the same time, though, how do we access this Father? How do we know him? If he's totally beyond us, we can't see him, then how, how can we relate to him at all? And how can we even come before this, this holy, awesome God when we're, we're so full of sin? So if we only talk of the Father, then there can be a lack of relationship, a lack of intimacy. Because how can we possibly relate to, 
How can we possibly know? Who are we before this, this awesome, holy, majestic God? On the other hand, uh, in some churches I notice that if they refer to God, they almost always refer to the Son. They always refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this itself is quite interesting. I think there's two versions of this. There's a conservative one and there's a liberal one. In the conservative one, they will talk a lot about Jesus because they are very clear and very strong on the gospel, on what Jesus has done, and on our legal standing before the Father God through Jesus, and the fact that we can study, by opening the Bible, we can study the gospels, we can study the life of Jesus, and we can learn about what he did on the cross. Then I'd say there's actually a liberal one, which also likes to talk a lot about Jesus, but there it's very much Jesus as the example, as like the moral example, Jesus is a good man who I follow. But it's very true, Jesus says, whoever sees me sees the Father. Jesus is the, is the way in, isn't he? He is the door, he is the gate, he is the key that unlocks all of this. But Jesus also says, what does he say? We sometimes forget this. He says, um, no one comes to the Father except through me. So what Jesus is saying, and what he has done when he, he dies on the cross through the gospel, that he makes a way to come to the Father. So he doesn't say that he is the terminal. He doesn't say that I am the end of the destination, that you know me. He says it's through me that you come to know this Father, who otherwise would be well, how would we know him? We can't see him. How can we approach him? He is perfectly holy. We cannot. But only through Jesus can we come to the Father. And then in other churches, it may be that most of the way we refer to God is by the Holy Spirit. That most of the focus is on the Holy Spirit in the services. And that's because we like it to be imminent. The Holy Spirit is, is with us. We like God to be imminent. We like this truth that he is with us right here now, as he is. We also like the experiential thing, that the Spirit lives in us. We experience the Spirit. We know his, his presence. And this is vital, absolutely vital and life-giving and essential. We're talking about the risk of this. I suppose the risk in that, though, if we only talk with the Holy Spirit, is then we can become very subjective. It becomes only about what we are experiencing at that moment only becomes about the imminent God, not about Father God, not about the work of the Son and what he has done for us. It also uh, can sometimes drag us down because then it becomes only about our experience, it also becomes about how we might be just feeling in that moment. And if we go on our feelings alone, sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down, sometimes we feel spiritually on fire, sometimes we maybe feel spiritually tired. So that alone is not is not enough. And we're also aware of our imperfections. We're aware of our sin. That's part of our life experience, isn't it? Sin as well as the good and the bad stuff. So if we take those things just on their own, you see what I'm saying here? If we take it on our own, if we only talk of the Father, or only talk of the Son, or only talk of the Spirit, then there's a weakness in that. We need all of the, all of the things that come from Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We need to enter into a full Trinitarian life in our church and individually. I'm going to think a little bit about what that, what that means. So let's use an example of prayer. Prayer is thoroughly Trinitarian, isn't it? Like when you pray, who do we pray to? Well, actually, we can, we can pray to anyone. We can pray to Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, because they are all God. And you can find examples in the Bible of people praying to Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You remember how Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, though, how does he begin? Our Father, our Father. So when we pray like that, we are coming to a loving Father. And he's revealed as the Father because he is the Father of the Son, Jesus. And how is it that we can actually pray to him? We pray to him through Jesus, the Son, who has made a way for us. Yeah. And how do we pray? We pray by in the Holy Spirit. He's the one who helps us to pray, who uh, intercedes with us with, um, with groanings that words cannot express, depending on how you translate that. So it's a hugely Trinitarian thing. 
So when we pray, you know that you're brought up into the life of the Trinity and the richness and the wonder of that relationship. There's nothing mundane about prayer. It's nearly incredible that you were coming before the very throne room of God. We're entering into uh, a relationship, and we're exercising our relationship with him to speak to Father God through the Son and by the Holy Spirit. Or, or what about worship? We worshipped this morning. We had a wonderful time. Thank you, Julia, for that. We had a wonderful time together. But actually, if you think about this, our worship is Trinitarian. That we're worshipping Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That we can only, again, come before God in our worship through the Son. So even where our worship is, uh, is, is, is lacking in any way in our hearts, that actually through, through Jesus, it looks beautiful and perfect. And we're taking, at that point, we are uh, entering into the worship that exists in the Trinity. As the Son worships the Father, as the Spirit worships and brings glory to the Son and the Father, we are part of that too. And our worship is inspired and enabled. We want to worship in spirit and in truth. Thoroughly, thoroughly Trinitarian. Here's another one. Unity. You can find in the Bible, it talks about unity coming from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that makes sense, doesn't it? We are a family of one Father. We have one Father, our Heavenly Father. And we are brothers and sisters through Jesus. That's what he calls us. He calls us brothers and sisters. And it talks about the unity. It says, make every effort to maintain the unity of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that fantastic? And that adds a deep element to this, you know, that, that when we uh, are, are speaking to somebody, uh, when we are spending some time having fellowship with, with, with somebody in the church, with another believer, it's not just what it appears on the outside. It's not just a friendship like another friendship, but actually we relate to each other through Jesus because we are children of the Father and by the Holy Spirit. So it's, it's like a mediated relationship. It's not actually just person to person, but there is something spiritual happening there, something really, really profound. And that's why it's so, so precious and special. Just go back to that passage we looked at the beginning from Ephesians chapter 2. It says, Through him, Jesus, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. That's what we are, and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. In him too you are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his, his spirit. You see all the trinity here. But also what it tells us, and we understand this more perhaps when we think about the trinity, is that there is a, a way that this is meant to be. So you've got to have these ingredients here. What's the foundation? He doesn't say the foundation of the Spirit. He says the foundation is Christ Jesus. The foundation is the apostles and prophets. So there's a base here. So the church is based on Jesus. And think about that. We're talking about the strength. Of when we talk a lot about Jesus in churches, they talk about Jesus a lot. There's an emphasis on who we are before God in Christ. The absolutely fixed, firm, people say legal, in a sense, the legal foundation of who you are before God is in Jesus. And that foundation, that platform, is absolutely needed. Because if you take it away, then your ground becomes uh, boggy. It becomes unclear. It becomes undulating and soft. And then we need a firm foundation of Jesus. So we know exactly who we are in Christ and what he has done for us on the cross, that you are forgiven, you are made perfect, you are made righteous in his sight. You've been justified, brought into his family. And then when we have that, then we become, this is just like scaffolding. We're being built together to become a dwelling, a house, in which God lives by his spirit. So this church is a house for God to live in by his spirit, where we can enjoy the freedom, the presence, the imminence. We can experience God as he lives with us by the Holy Spirit. And who is this for? It is for the Father, the one whom we have access to. It's all for, for his glory. There's a richness to this. But there's a cautionary note here. What are we talking about then, being Trinitarian? This doesn't mean that 
we have to like carefully plan our services so that we refer to like one third of the time to the Father, one third of the time to the Son, one third of the time to the Holy Spirit. That would just be kind of artificial and ridiculous. But there's this word perichoresis that means like mutual indwelling, right? So the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit actually indwell. Now this is like kind of I think beyond our minds. But Jesus says it. He says it in John 14, verse 11. He says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Right? And this is really important and quite profound. There's something that flows from this. Now, we'll talk about this a bit more. This means that if we say something like, um, if we speak of the Holy Spirit and we say, let's have a, a time of listening to the Holy Spirit, something I often would say. But because the Father and the Son indwell the Holy Spirit, that when we say that, at the same time, we're actually also saying, let's have a time of listening to the Father and listening to the Son. Because the Father and the Son are in the Holy Spirit. They indwell. They mutually indwell each other. When we come to communion, right, and we talk about focusing on, on Jesus, actually at the same time we're focusing on the Father and the Holy Spirit too. And here's something really important as well that comes from this. When Jesus died on the cross, and this is the orthodox tradition, when Jesus died on the cross, Jesus died as a man, right? Jesus died as a man, but he suffered as the eternal Son of God. And because of the mutual indwelling, the Father and the Spirit also suffered. It's important to understand that. It's not that, you know, there was a distant Father who kind of cruelly sent his son Jesus and then tortures him on the cross. That's a poor caricature. It comes from wrong thinking about the Trinity. That's not what happens. But the Father and the, and the Son and the Spirit suffered in Jesus on the cross. The Father willingly and the, son, and the Spirit and the Son willingly did this. They didn't die. Jesus died in his flesh, the flesh that he, he took on board, but they suffered on the cross. Now, there's an expression that talks about the way that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work together. And not all of this is completely agreed by everyone, and we have to be a bit careful with this. There's something called inseparable operations. Right, it sounds very technical. Inseparable operations. What it means is that the work of God in the world is undivided. And actually, you can see this on the pages of the Bible, right? Because if you look through the Bible, you can usually see that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at some point are all said to be doing something that is the same or very similar or involved. So, is the Father loving? Yes. Is the Son loving? Yes. Is the Spirit loving? We're loved by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Is the Father gracious? Yes. The Son is gracious. The Spirit is gracious. Is the Father holy? Yes. The Son is holy. The Spirit is holy. You see where I'm going with this. Everything you can say of God, you can say of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they're all present. Think of creation. The Father was involved in creation. The Son, the Spirit. Think of Jesus' work on the cross. Think of the resurrection. Pick these ones up from here. So see what it says here in Acts 2, 24. It said, God raised him up. Him is Jesus. So God the Father raised up Jesus. So who raised Jesus from the dead? The Father did in Acts 2, 24. But what about John 10, 18? Jesus says, no one takes it up from me. Sorry, no one takes it from me. That's my life but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. So who raises Jesus from the dead? Jesus, the Son, raises himself from the dead. Okay. Or 1 Peter 3, verse 18, it says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So who raised Jesus from the dead? The Holy Spirit did. So you see, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are working together in everything that they do. So when we wait on the Spirit, we're waiting also on the Father and the Son. Now this is difficult to get our head around here. So you might say then, okay, well, well, how come then we distinguish them at all? Why do we say Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? So we have to be a bit careful. And not everyone agrees with this. There's something called appropriations. This is the way the church tried to understand this, right? So yeah, you can say the same of everyone, but there is perhaps a way of talking that is most suited to a person of the Trinity. So we don't say the Father died on, well, obviously the Father didn't die on the cross. 
We don't say the Father suffered on the cross. We don't normally talk about it on that way, the cross as being the Father's work. We normally talk about it being the Son's work, because that's most suited to the Son. There's something we can talk about um, when we uh, talk about the creation of the world. We generally tend to think about the, the Father being Father God, the Creator, although the Son and the Spirit were also involved in the work of creation as well. Now, it's quite difficult, these, because it's easy to lean one way or the other, a bit more towards, you know, almost thinking like there are three individuals, or at the same other hand, thinking that there's just one person who manifests in different ways. So we've got to be a little bit careful, a little bit careful with this. But there's something very rich and profound in this, I think. Something remarkable. And it really underlines this point that we need to remember and to express the Father, Son, Holy Spirit in all that we do. Sometimes the way this is kind of... Uh, uh, expressed is, is through these little sayings. You can remember these. Um, we can say, by the Father, through the Son, and in the Spirit. Because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, they relate to each other in, in, in different ways. So the Father uh, is the Father of the Son, the eternally begotten Son, and the Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. So they, they from the beginning, have different relations to each other. But it means that, that I think in everything that we do, you know, every part of the church life, we need to be conscious of this being from the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. And you need in your daily life to be aware of all three of these things. And we as a church need to be very aware of all three of these things. Otherwise you're missing out. We don't have the full richness, the completeness of the Trinity. Or we could say from the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. And our response is, this is really, really neat, our response actually is, kind of if you turn that around, it's like the reverse, right? Because when we say, when we, we, we pray or worship, meditate on God, it's, oh, it's in the Spirit, through the Son, to the Father. Do you see? It's, it's kind of beautiful, isn't it? So we've been brought into the life of God, just to wrap up, who is eternally three persons. I think it's great to understand this and to enter into this more and more deeply. And we really need to have an ever deepening uh, awareness of this. How, how can we do this? So how can we do this? Just a few suggestions then. So firstly, I think reflect. It's good just to begin to think about this. We thought about some of the images, the illustrations, their limitations. But think about things we can say of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's good just to reflect, even daily, just to think when we pray. Who am I praying to? To the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Just to get our heads around this a bit more. And when we pray, to pray that we might have a deeper understanding, individually and as a church, of, of the Trinity, of God's life. When we speak, to be fully expressive of the Trinity in our language, to be speaking in our services, to be speaking to other people in our own thought life of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I think to have an appreciation, you know, a real appreciation, and to begin to understand, wow, what does this mean that we have been caught up and brought into the very life of God himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Not a small thing. It's, a, it's an eternal, phenomenal, incredible thing. And that should stir us to, to worship. That we can come before Father God through the incredible work of Jesus on the cross. He is the way into this. He is the gate, the key to it all. And it's absolutely necessarily, then I think we understand, that we cannot do that ourselves, but only by the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful, complete picture of the life of God and how we are brought into that. Let's just pray. Just to come before God to, uh, to seek his help with these things. Father, I know how um, glibly I sometimes speak or sound talking about these things. And we thank you that uh, through Jesus we've been brought into a relationship with you, Lord, with Jesus, your Son, with the Holy Spirit. We thank you that 
that he answers in that sense, that, that you answer every question in your being. That you are both the one who made all things, who is um, supreme, who is beyond our imagination, but also the one who calls us friend in Jesus. The one who your disciples saw face to face, the one whom we can know as, uh, as a brother. And that you are with us as your intangible but close and precious Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, for all of us here that we would enter into this more and more deeply and richly. That all our, our churches would appreciate and value who you are in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In so doing, Lord, that we would be uh, worshipful and transformed, and uh, that we would know the joy and the love and the peace that is there. that we stand on the solid ground of Jesus. We pray, Father, you might please so fill us with your Holy Spirit that we might have an ever deeper insight and understanding and living out of these things to your glory. Amen.